You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. This episode is brought to you by Pepsi Wild Cherry. Pepsi Wild Cherry is bursting with delicious cherry flavor and a sweet, crisp taste that gives you more to go wild for. Getting wild may look different these days, but whether it's opting for a solo Friday binge watch or a big night out, everyone can indulge in their wild side with Pepsi Wild Cherry, also available in Zero Sugar. So grab a Pepsi Wild Cherry and get wild. Actually, it's the, it's the lead play in our, in our offense. We ask our YN or a tight end to open up somewhere between six feet and nine feet. Get an isolation with the with the linebacker. Tell the tackle to take the defensive end if he's open. If he's not, to drive down on the first man to his inside. If the YN has the linebacker taken out, he cuts inside. If the YN has the linebacker here, he comes all the way around. If you look at this play, what we're trying to get is a seal here and a seal here and try to run this play in the alley. What's up, guys? Welcome into Packers Total Access. My name is Clayton. You can check us out on Packernet.com. You can find me on Twitter at Packers underscore access. You can email us, Packers Total Access at gmail.com. You can text us, 865-658-5824. I'm joined alongside Tim, live in Green Bay. We got Emilio with a fresh cut. Emilio! (laughs) He's down here in Tennessee, and we got the bearded wonder, Jacob, in Wisconsin. (laughs) in an undisclosed location in Wisconsin. All right. So obviously the big news today was uh, we, uh, we signed a new kicker, right. And um, we're going to talk about that for about an hour and a half. Now, obviously we got uh, the news that came down the wire that Joe Barry is out as DC. Notice we didn't say fired. Got to choose your words carefully out there, people. Um, it didn't say anything about him being fired. It said that he would not remain as the D.C., right? So that specific wording there kind of got my ears perked up like, oh, he's probably going to be in the building. Now, is it a guarantee? No. But, um, again, uh, what I can see is is maybe a, a demotion back to linebacker coach or maybe just some kind of special assistant, maybe assistant to the regional manager, something mm-hmm. like that, right? Probably see coming down the pike. But uh, initial thoughts as we go around the horn. I know we were live this morning when the news dropped. But um, obviously, a lot of times past since then, as I make this awkward, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like that, that <laughs> so um, around the horn, let's start down there with Jacob. I want to get his raw emotion here. Joe Barry is out. Jacob, thoughts? I mean, it's a mixed bag of emotions. Um, I think it <laughs> needed maybe to happen, but I don't know, man. I, I feel bad. The guy's got a family. Uh, people were literally like celebrating, you know. It's, it's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and the guy, like, like we've do, we've dove into the stats, and it's just not fair to really hate the guy the way that we, the fan base, kind of overall does. Same with the kicker situation. That just seems a little bit too. I mean, they they did sign a new kicker, so that, I guess they they feel kind of a uh, not sure at the position. But as far as Joe Barryman, I mean, I I just I want us to make sure that our defense doesn't take a step back, and I'm worried that we're going to do that after building and drafting and developing and doing all this kind of stuff, learning the scheme, finally getting comfortable. And then all to see, you know, like, like guys dropping interceptions and not doing their coverage right and not knowing what the coverage is. And it just, I just, I hope that we get a, uh, an ex player or um, I like your guy from Baltimore. That to me sounds really cool. Uh, Vic Fangio would be great, but it sounds like we might have to fight Philly for that. So um, yeah. I don't know, man, I'm, I'm just kind of, it's exciting, that's for sure. The off season is definitely not dull. That's <laughs> we've got plenty to talk about. Yeah. Did you guys see the camera shaking here? I'm on puppy duty tonight, and uh, Lincoln is rocking the whole desk here. So uh, the whole just bear with me, all right? He's just down there uh, chewing on a bone, thinking he owns the joint. But Emilio, your initial thoughts on Joe uh, Barry being yeah. relieved of his duty? Kind of, uh, kind of on Jacob's point there. I mean, he's a, I mean. He's a person, right? Everyone, the, the fact that like they had to have a scapegoat, you know, everyone on, on Twitter and everything, finding somebody's head to chop off. I mean, you know, 
we don't use the guillotine anymore for a reason, but like the, uh, I mean, I, I was happy with Joe. We, you know, we made progress. I like how you brought up the point of the wording. I wouldn't mind if he stuck around, you know, everyone likes him. He's got, he's got a good vibe. Maybe he can bridge the gap for the new court, you know, the new coordinator um, and put it into, you know, his sort of terms or, you know, kind of work that back and forth. But um, I mean, it's tough, man. It is a business though. So at, at some point a decision has to be made and they, they made the decision. Now we move on and we keep moving forward. We, we can't keep looking in the rear view, um, you know, appreciate him and everything he's done for us. But now we're moving forward. Let's start searching and keep moving. Yeah, we're going to go over a list, too, of potential defensive coordinators. And the list we're going to start with was actually tweeted out by Ryan Schlipp, who uh, – and I like his approach. It was these are the coaches that have already been interviewed for D.C. jobs. Okay, so it's kind of like – it seems like from the NFL spectrum, these are the guys at the forefront. Um, I, I'll be real with you. There's just two or three of them on that list that I'm excited about. But, uh, yeah, Tim, what do you think, man? Initial thoughts. I know we we talked about it a little bit earlier this morning, but just your thoughts on the surface there with Joe. Yeah, Bird. I mean, you guys all know where I stand on this. It's not a secret. Um, I don't have much in the line to offer for, uh, you know, excitement for new candidates. Um, I did think we should have hung on a Joe as DC for another year. I actually, I mean, really thought Matt should have brought him in from the jump um, if we want to go all the way back. But I do feel like Emilio, you know, the decision has been made. It's time to look forward. So I think that uh, we're going to see what direction things are going to go based off of this uh, replacement, whoever the, the new hire or the promotion within that could come. Whoever the D.C. is, is going to tell us if, in fact, maybe Joe stays on. I think if you, you know, switch schemes all together, you know, maybe we go back to the four three. I don't know. Um, you know, if, if you've got a complete changing of the guard, sometimes you have to do that. And other coaches and staff need to go as well. And you bring a new system in and you start start building um i think if we bring another coordinator in that wants to run some of the same concepts and kind of looks at the defense in a similar way i'll i'll leave that coordinator's name out of there um but i do see a, a path that joe barry does stay on as a you know senior advisor coaching assistant linebacker coach something um i wouldn't be completely shocked uh but yeah hey we you know the days come um you know I had fun on Twitter watching people that dragged Joe Barry for the last two and a half, three years, uh, walk back all of their their nasty words and say the, uh, you know, boilerplate politically correct stuff about him today. And I thought that was adorable and cute. But uh, I remember <laughs> I remember your your actual sentiment. So uh, that was entertaining. Um, but I will say this. I wish Joe the best. I hope, um, you know, hope it's not the end for him in Green Bay uh, for a lot of reasons, mainly the relationship with the players and the staff and people inside at 1265. Um, so I, I, I see a demotion hopefully and not run out of town, but uh, you never know, you know, NFL stands for not for long. And uh, you know, I'm sure us Packer fans will give the new DC, you know, five or 10 minutes before we scream about firing him too. So, you know, I'm excited for the future. Uh, the unknown can be an exciting time. Uh, we'll see how this uh, plays out, I guess. That's how I feel. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny that your response or your reaction because Kay Adams had a similar one. I'm going to play a video here in a second, but let's get to these super chats. So Jason Y, thank you so much, buddy. We appreciate you. He said, it's hard to see the defense improving with the new D.C. if guys don't play better individually and miss tackles and blow coverages. I'll add that one in there, Jason. I completely agree. Thank you for the super chat, pal. Something that Wildy and Tausch talked about earlier today, and a caller called it the very first call they took after the news was announced with Joe Barry being fired. And the caller was like, I – think you guys are setting yourself up for a big disappointment. It's basically what he was saying. Like, you know, it, you're, he, it, it literally, if he had a redneck accent, they probably would have thought it was me calling him because it was almost word for word. He said, Joe Barry's not telling these guys to stand in an area where there's no wide receivers trying to attack and let them come to him. I promise you he's not doing that. It's essentially what his call was saying. And Wildy pointed out how they improved – and then he pointed out what many people aren't talking about is how they broke camp so undermanned that it wasn't even funny, especially in the secondary, that you're going out there with a seventh-round pick and a, whatever it was, a sixth-round pick or undrafted or whatever Ballantyne is. Um, and, you know, thought he did a pretty good job con with all things considered. But, uh, again, Jason, thank you for the super chat, buddy. J Josh Martin with the super chat. Thanks, pal. Appreciate you. He says, clean the entire defensive coach as a fresh start. You know, Josh, I think – I would somewhat agree with that, but 
the frustrating part for me is if we just bring in another guy kind of of that tree and it's just okay, Joe, listen, man, they got they got really loud out here. Let's just why don't you go coach linebackers and we'll bring in this guy to basically keep doing the same thing. I, I hate that idea. You know, it's like, what's the point? Um, but again, you know, the, the fans do they they can they can have some impact on decisions that are made. I know people think that's silly. And Tim, I want to I want to echo your you know your sentiment there as far as what happened on Twitter today. You, I remember reading tweets from people, and it was literally, you know, f this bum, get this moron out of here, all this. And then today it was like, guys, guys, can we can we please like let's don't. Let's be respectful to Joe and his family. It's like, yeah. are yeah. You, you really? Where'd that come from? Yeah, let's let's virtue signal. Woo, look at me. I'm a good person. I was like, oh, yeah. Anyway, and then you had others that were just, you could tell they were ready to get the clicks, baby. They were, you know, acting like <laughs> idiots, all excited. And, this. and it's hilarious to me, too, that the people that get so excited about seeing someone else have a downfall, are the same ones that if you go back on their timeline two weeks ago, it's like, oh, just life's kicking my ass, and it's just, I need a pity party. And then somebody gets fired, and they're running around like, woo, yeah. He's got to go home and stare his family in the eye. Like, drives me insane. Anyway, here's what Kay Adams said. Um, I love Kay Adams. I think she's awesome. I think she brings a an approach to covering the game. where, I, Like I always say, it's like it's like your, your, your little sister talking ball, right? And she always – she never tries to sound smart. She never tries to act like she's a professional. It's just she's a huge football fan talking ball, and she knows ball too. Um, I just want you to kind of listen to what she says here, and I won't be able to – actually, I think I did screenshot the tweets. If I did, I'll pull them up. But uh, here was Kay Adams on Up and Adams this morning. Don't love about it. Well, first of all, he's – beloved by everyone so and, and the, the, you can tell even by the team as they played the heck out of themselves for him and the fact by the way their past defense ranked ninth they finished ahead of their past offense which was 12th just saying which was wild they finished the season strong it's the right move but let's not kick the kick the guy out the door and anyway or uh, while we do that um and and here's why also i don't like it or i'm weary and i'm not even a packers like f- like a fan but i i'm in love with the packers fan so i like i'm very into i like know this fan base very well um when she said that i said she's in love with the packers fans at jacob <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, what are they going to do next that isn't Groundhog's Day? Groundhog's Day is coming up. It's February 2nd. Like You yeah. keep getting rid of defensive coordinators, and you keep having the same problem. So oh. what's going to prevent this from being the next issue and the next wave? This right now is a critical hire. This is going to go a long way in determining whether or not Green Bay is able to cash in during this window. So that's what I would say. I would say, sure, we're like, but like, we're so, we, I can name a ton of defensive coordinators the Packers have gone through in a revolving door and we still have these same issues so is it personnel is it whatever have you just always had the wrong guy find the right guy and good luck all right so she it, she caught a lot of a lot of heat as you could imagine making her comment yeah, of course and then she quote tweeted that video if i remember correctly and put these attached to it, it said packer fans asking to fire dcs literally goes back to the beginning of twitter so you can go all the way back to like 08 Hey, hey, Ted Thompson. Hey, hey, Mike McCarthy. Now we can fire Bob Sanders. When is enough enough, idiots? <laughs> and then you go later on in 08, right? Someone else. Um, the Packers, uh, it's, I love the Packers, but somebody please fire Bob Sanders today. Watching these games is just painful. Then you fast forward to 2017. Steps to a Packers Super Bowl. One, fire Dom Capers. <laughs> <laughs> Two, sign free agents. Three, get a new trainer so our entire team isn't hurt by week three. Like, you could slap a 2023 tag on that, and I would think it happened this year. Um, then the next one in 2018, one year later, fire Dom Capers, okay? And then you go down to 20 – I can't see the 2020. It's covered up. But then in 2021, fire Mike Pettin. Fire Mike Pettin now. And then fire, fire. Pettin. <laughs> and then at the very top, you can't see it, but it says fire Joe Barry. All right, so, hey, 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 that's just the way we talk in the clink. It's just, uh, it's wild, man. It, it's, and, and listen, there's, you're going to get that in every fan base. I get that argument. I understand I'm trying to be unrealistic there, but the, I didn't approach this this season going, um, okay, whose fault is it? 
I was trying to get answers. I'm going, why does this keep happening? It happened with Bob Sanders. It happened with Dom Capers. It's happened with Mike Pettin. Now it happened with, with uh, Joe Barry. And it's like, why does this keep happening? And the only answer that I can come up with is it's how we draft on defense. That's it. How, look at how Baltimore drafts. Who did they draft this last year? Kyle Hamilton. The one that many people looked at and said, you see how he ran his 40 yard ball? Oh, 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 I wouldn't touch that. Arguably the best safety in the league. At least top three safety in the league. They approach it totally different. How many Bears fans absolutely ragged on Roquan Smith when he was with the Bears, right? Packers fans just ragged on, he ain't nothing. He goes to Baltimore, what happens? Boom. Blows up, right? Has, has the best year he's had yet. Um, I'm just saying I, that's the only answer I can come up with. And I'm not even saying it's the correct answer. It's just the only one that I can logically go. That's probably got a lot to do with it. So, um, with that being said, we had another chat in here. I've seen you marking him. Doug, I've seen this all day and it blew my mind. Doug in chat says, I bet 80% of Packer fans on Twitter saying F Joe Barry, all right, Joe Barry, FJB, whatever you want to do, uh, were like, quote, hire Fangio. People never cease to amaze me. Doug, you hit the nail on the head, buddy. You just fired a guy and complained about the system all year long. And now you want to hire the guy who basically invented that system or perfected it, if you will, who just got run out of Miami, which, by the way, had a worse defense than we had this year. Like, it's just – Oh, we're going to give him some <laughs> I, I, And listen, if you're, if you're genuinely asking, like, hey, should we, hire my, should we hire Vic Fangio? Like, we can have that conversation. There's nothing wrong with that conversation. But just to go, now we can get Fangio. I'm like, did you watch football this year? <laughs> and the league is cyclical, right? These, these trends are very cyclical. <clears throat> what it tells you is the shell coverage, right, this Fangio zone match game, it's cyclical, and it's just like we talked about the Matt LaFleur, the Shanahan offense there, and the RPO aspect of it the last two years. Defense is caught up, right? It's going to come back, too. It's just you got to find that defensive staff and more specifically that defensive coordinator that's going to adapt, evolve with the game. I think we've seen that this year when Joe Barry started switching to more single high and he started to go with more man coverage. Now, it cost us some explosive plays and, in my opinion, cost us games, but he did adjust. And immediately, immediately, those same same people that are bad mouthing Joe Barry on on Twitter, immediately went to well, that, that's because Matt Lafleur made him. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. So there's nothing this dude can do to make you happy, right? Like it just, we need to be better educated as a fan base, myself included. Um, so I think it's important to kind of dig in and say, okay, what exactly is going on? Why is this stuff happening? Yeah, and I like what I like what AFAM said there too. At least we have Bo Melton. That's Great. right. By the way, and then Paul Robertson jumped in the chat earlier. I had to mark this when he said, hi, <laughs> man. I was hot yoga tonight. <laughs> so, Wait, did we get the response? I did not. I'm scared. Yeah. Be Are you sure? I thought we had that up there. Oh, no. Yeah, you're right. AFAM responded with, Paul and Eric cooked their steaks in the dishwasher and claims it's just like sous vide. <laughs> <laughs> I love this crew, man. Absolutely love it. Uh, All right. So let's talk about the top candidates now that the deed is done, right? We got we the head rolled today. Everyone took their victory laps. Everyone's feeling good about it. Not everyone, but you know who I'm talking about. Some some people got mad. Watch watch the number will go down. There it is. He just got pissed and left. Cool. Yep. Thanks for swinging by. Um, but uh, yeah. So you got what you wanted. Now let's move on. All right. Let's move on and talk about, sure about how can we that? make this defense better. So. Pack Daddy tweeted this out earlier, Ryan Schlipp, and this was a list of – he said, here's the current list of coaches that have interviewed or have been requested to interview for D.C. jobs. I love how he didn't say, here's my favorites. He said, here's where the smoke's at, okay? Chris Harris, defensive passing game coordinator slash cornerbacks for the Titans. Uh, Terrell or Terrell Williams, assistant head coach, defensive line for the Titans. Ryan Nielsen, former Atlanta Falcons defensive coordinator, but today he was actually hired – by the Jacksonville Jaguars, so he's off the market. Shane Bowen, a former D.C. for the Titans. Uh, you've got Evero, Jairo Evero, um, the, the D.C. for the Panthers, although the request was denied because they're still holding out. They have his rights until they can deny a lateral move until they decide to move on from him or if they want to keep him. So it would take someone giving him a head coaching job before he would leave the Panthers, essentially is what that means. So I know people are saying his name, but – He's not even available right now, okay? Chris Hewitt, this is my darling. You guys know this is my favorite choice as it sits right now, and I haven't dug too deep. 
He's the defensive passing game coordinator for the Ravens. You got Marquand Manuel, who used to play for the Packers, safety's coach for the Jets. That one kind of cracks me up because there was some Packer fans saying they really liked that. And I'm going, if he wasn't a former Packer, would you even know who he is? Right? Like that. You've got to remove that bias, in my opinion. Wink Martindale, former DC for the Giants. I like Wink. Can he be a number two guy or is he one of those? Is he is he going to piss off his third straight organization in a row? Right. That's the question. Uh, Demarcus Covington, defensive line coach for the Patriots. I like that. Um, Michael Hodges, linebackers coach for the Saints. Um, the Saints are actually surprisingly good. I'm going to pull the numbers here in a second for you guys to show you. But the Saints actually had a pretty good year um, defensively. Uh, let's see where was I at. Tim, or I'm sorry, Tam, I guess. Hey, U.S. Cellular customers, I've got good news, so don't hit skip forward just yet. I'm talking about their special customer event, Us Days. What's Us Days? It means exclusive offers just for their customers, just to say thanks, like up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. No, I didn't just misread that. That's up to $1,200 off. They must really like you. Us Days at U.S. Cellular, exclusive offers just for you, just to say thanks. Right now, U.S. Cellular customers get up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. Terms apply. Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda, you never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, Priceline. Lukabu, I hope I'm saying it right, outside linebacker coach for the Panthers. You got Christian Parker, DB coach for the Broncos. Derek Ansley, DC for the Chargers. Bobby uh, Babich, linebacker coach for the Bills. I don't, I don't, I don't mind that one too much. I'd like to dig into that. Anthony Camp- Campanelli, I think that's how you say it, Campanile, linebacker coach for the Dolphins. Uh, Denard Wilson, DB coach for the Ravens. I really like that one. Anyone out of that Ravens organization, I am cool with bringing them for an interview and see if they knock it out of the park. Mike Caldwell, former D.C. for the Jaguars. And Ron Rivera, Riverboat Ron, former head coach for the Commanders. Also a member of your favorite 85 Bears uh, as a player. So those are the guys that Ryan listed off that obviously we're talking about. Uh, them getting offered D.C. or not getting offered D.C. jobs, but have at least been requested or have interviewed. Okay, I'm going to go around the horn once here, um, and then we're going to pull a bunch of numbers. And the reason I'm doing this, I want to get y'all's take before we look at all the numbers. Okay, right off the top of your head, I'm going to put you on the spot, Tim. Who's the first candidate that comes to mind that you go, I'd be okay with that? What comes to mind for you? For this? Uh, I'm kind of going to steal yours. I, I'm kind of. Can you pr- bring that list up again? Yeah, I'm going to. I have a couple of notes, but. Mm-hmm. You know, what sticks out to me right away is um, anyone with Ravens next to their name. Um, I'm telling you, man. That's so- Chris, Chris Hewitt is is intriguing because, you know, passing game coordinator. Okay, we talk about what we need to do in our secondary. Bingo. You know, and, uh, you know, bringing the D.C. in with that type of mindset is not a bad idea. Um, and then, um, you know, I guess, yeah, I mean, out of this list, that's – it's got to be my top, you know. I mean, there's a few notable names on there, but nobody that I think is gonna is gonna come here, um, mm-hmm. including Wink. You know, uh, I just I think yeah. it's a long shot for Wink too, man. I really do. Yeah, and um, you know, I think I also agree with the sentiment that uh, we should probably stay away from anyone with, uh, you know, like the Titans <laughs> after their name um, comes to mind. So yeah, I'm I'm gonna go. I'm gonna steal yours. I'm gonna go with Chris Hewitt out of this list. Okay. Um, and I get, and again, this is not Pack Daddy's like picks. This is just what's right what's out right. there. Who's currently interviewing? So, um, I mean, right. it's a long list, but yeah, I mean, man, I can't. It's it's difficult to come up with a second name. It really uh, is, man. And, and you know, there's a large pool to pull from, right? Yeah. Josh Martin with the super chat, appreciate you, buddy. He said, now that Barry's gone, uh, who takes over cornerback one from Preston Smith? LOL. But in all serious, I hope we hire someone who teaches fundamentals and communication so you're talking about the position coaches right because that's who's teaching that stuff not the dc the dc is coordinating the defense defensive coordinator he's not you know trying to teach fundamentals and communication understand the way it works 
he pulls all of his position group uh, position coaches together and goes, all right, here's the plan for Sunday, right? Here's, here's what we're looking at doing. Okay. I need you to work on this with them, this with them, this with them. The DC can't communicate with everybody on the field, right? It's just not possible. I have a good friend, Vince. Uh, I tell you guys about this all the time. He played outside linebacker slash edge in that hybrid defense in new England way back when uh, I think it was, I think it was around 07, if I remember correctly. Anyway, he ends up going to the chiefs too. He left with uh, Bill or not Bill Polian, but uh, Scott Pioli when Pioli took over GM to chiefs. And I asked him, I said, what do you think? I love asking this question to people who played in the NFL coaching. I go, what's one thing that player that, that fans don't understand that players understand? Like, like what's the one thing that you think they, they have no clue. And he said, you know, the big one for me, Clayton, he said, they think we're just always together all the time. He said, it's it's totally the opposite. Yes, we're on the practice field together, but as soon as that practice is over, we part ways and we all go to our position groups and, and we got our own meeting rooms, our own coordinator, our, our own uh, position coach, and we're with them like 90% of the time. Yep. And that's the reason I bring that up, Josh. Now, as far as the Preston Smith thing, I know that's a big joke and everybody gets a good kick out of it and everything. You can watch every single 34 defense in the National Football League and you will find an outside linebacker slash edge covering in coverage multiple times this year, including T.J. Watt, who is arguably the best pass rusher in the league. Now, why is that? Because when you play a 34 jam and you put five on the line of scrimmage, you're not always going to be blitzing five. So when they manipulate the offense or manipulate the formation and put someone in motion and you need someone to cover and you know that outside linebacker is dropping anyway, you'll see them stand up and try to get a little bit of leverage and hold on tight because they just out-schemed you in that specific situation. You, if you called a timeout every time that happened, then you're going to be out of timeouts within the first and third quarter. Okay. So what I'm saying is if they go 4-3, you'll never see Preston Smith in coverage again unless they run a really, really exotic fire zone blitz. If they go 34 again, you're going to see it next year. And I'm going to tell you, there's one guy that's going to be obnoxious when it happens next year. <laughs> this cat right here. And I'm going to go, I'm gonna go, oh, my God, I thought Joe Barry was the only one who did it. <laughs> so, anyway, um, yeah, thank you for the super chat, Josh. But, uh, yeah, as far as fundamentals of communication, that's the part that worries me. If you just bring in a D.C., you leave everyone else intact, don't expect that stuff to fix itself. Don't. Um, that's just me personally. Uh, let's see. So, Emilio, on to yeah. you, buddy. Who's your Who's your choice? Uh, first First thing that comes to mind. Any, anybody? I, honestly, I'm just name wise. I'm not good with that. But I would say, aren't we trying to look for that young, you know, up and coming? What do we want them to be? Thirty to forty ish, roughly. We don't want them to be, you know, kind of kind of too old. We We want the new Matt Lafleur for defense. So I think, um, like Jacob just sent over that, I haven't been able to dig through it, but um, you know, let's let's kind of look there. Who would be DB coaches, things like that. But again, to your point, they are with the you know with their position coaches. That's why you look at Dallas and you look at Al Harris and the DB group. They had what a hand bunch of picks the past two years or whatever. So he's teaching them those techniques in their individual rooms when he's when he's you know watching hips, watch eyes, things like that. Versus you know Joe Barry's up. Now up in the box, which I think he even did better up there. But like you're looking at, you're looking at the entire, you're looking at all eleven. You're not worried about just one. Um, you know, you're worried about the one doing their job, but you're worrying about it uh, as a whole. So, um, I couldn't pick a name. I'll I'll, uh, I'll do a little bit more research and I'll get back to you on it. You're good, man. You don't have to. I just didn't. I want to give you guys the floor if you go. Hey, I'm really excited about this guy. Right, Jake. Yeah, the, the only other point I had was yeah, Preston dropped in coverage, but I mean, come on. They're athletes, right? We, 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 you, you're telling me we can't ask them to cover a guy up for, you don't think they do that in practice though, like messing around. You did that all the time. You'd get in front of a, you get in front of a, um, oh, Tim, you're muted. It looks you're like, muted. yeah, you were about to light me up with something. No, I was going to say that's what, if there's an edge guy built to play pass coverage, it's right. Preston Smith, like <laughs> right. literally the mold of he, the type he, of edge exactly. that can do you're that. In front of him. You're in a zone anyway. I mean, you, you, you man up when they come there, but it's not like you're, you're not, we're not asking you to cover deep third, all right? And he never, never one time did he play man coverage. That's a, it's right. a false yep. narrative. They're like, oh, he's, they had him in man coverage. BS. It was zone coverage, and he was sitting out there to play the curl and to play the flat potentially. One time he played the flat that I seen the other, he played the curl. That's BS to think that Joe Barry said, hey, go out there, cover Tay, man to, man coverage. You got him. You got Tell him. Which brings me to my next point. Don't smoke crack. Very well said. Very well said. So, um, Mike Hebring with the super chat said new DC needs to be able to bring in his own staff. 
I agree, Mike. I do. Yep. I think, and I think that's going to steer a lot of people away too. When they sit down at the interview, that's probably going to be their parting question. So do I have free reign over my staff. And if they go, well, no, we're going to keep some people intact. Watch them get the heck out of Dodge. That's why you probably got a better chance at picking someone like a Chris Hewitt because they're looking for that that jump from passing game coordinator straight to DC or whatever. Right. Go ahead, Jacob. You got a pick, man. You got anybody that comes to mind for you? I do. Uh, that Bobby Babich guy from uh, Buffalo. And he is basically exactly what Emilio was talking about as far as that young and up and coming guy. But and he's a little re- a little raw, a little fresh, but he has almost 10 plus years of experience in the NFL and then a bunch in the college before that. He's a former player. He played four years at North Dakota State. Um, let's see, where were his attributes? So uh, he was last linebackers coach at Buffalo for the last few years. Before that, he was their safeties coach and a defensive backs assistant. Uh, he has been an administrator. Uh, he had been an actual secondary and defensive pass game coordinator. That was in college, though. He just kind of looks like the part, too. If you look like you could see him next to Matt LaFleur on the sideline, both mm-hmm. there with your little. Perfect. I love that snippet. That's perfect, Jacob. Okay. Everything. He's got years of experience. He played football. He was a DB's coach. He was a backer coach. I mean, the only thing he didn't do was D-line, and it's not like he didn't hop in and do that, you know, in Buffalo. So, I sign me up. I like that idea. That's good stuff, man. Mike Avery with the Super Chat says, and then be held accountable for his own staff. That's a that's another great point there, Mike. Thank you for the Super Chat, buddy. Uh, that's the whole purpose, right? It's like, okay, these are my guys. I need to make it work. You guys remember, I don't know if you listened to the uh, the Play Callers podcast that we all were going crazy over back in the summer. Uh, RG3 talked about that in it, that Kyle Shanahan made him pick one play from college and was like, hey, let's put that in the playbook. And then he asked him afterwards, he said, you know why it worked? He was like, what? Because you wasn't going to let it fail. That was your play. You took ownership of it. Now, understand, that's what I do on every single play I draw up for this offense. So run every single play that I call as if you drew it up, as if you wanted to make it work for you. Same type of mindset, right, Mike, with your own staff. You want to make that. You know what I mean? Not that Joe Barry didn't want to make it work, but I think he was just it was exactly what we thought. Matt LaFleur said, let's bring in a guy that will do exactly what I told him. And he didn't want that kind of independent voice in the room. And I'm not going to knock him for it. He won a lot of games doing that, right? That's the other thing, too. Like, the defense finished pretty strong, I thought. But, um, yeah. I know Jake had a comment in here that I wanted to hit real quick. He said the difference is what has what uh, has much more uh, feel slash athleticism to do that. Green Bay has gone big at edge in the 34 defense. Uh, I'm just not sure the philosophy meshes. The whole purpose of the 34 blitz – the reason it was created in the zone blitz was to manipulate the offense into thinking, okay, we have identified who's rushing the quarterback here. That's why the fire zone blitzes became so, you know, so important. Let me ask you this. Do you think that James Harrison was built with the athleticism to drop in the coverage? Because one of the most famous defensive plays in the history of the game was James Harrison dropping back in a fire zone blitz out of the outside linebacker position. One of the best pass rushers in the game that year, if not the best. Drops back in the end zone, picks it off, and takes it back for 99 yards or whatever it was for the big six. When the Pittsburgh Steelers would pretty much beat the Cardinals. And that was on, you know, future Hall of, first ballot Hall of Famer, Kurt Warner. Every – again, I challenge people. I challenge people. Find me one team that runs a 34 defense that doesn't have outside linebackers dropping into coverage. Find me one. Just one. I would – I'm not saying it isn't out there. I just – I would not waste my time trying to find it. <laughs> Guarantee you, you'll get three or four weeks in and go, oh, yep, he was in coverage right there. Yep, he was in coverage. You, Let me give you another one. B.J. Raji. <laughs> if if they've got 320-pound nose tackles dropping back from time to time in a 34 zone, mm-hmm. defense, do you think they've got the edge defenders dropping, right? So, um, again, is it ideal? No, but when they pick the pass off, nobody's complaining, right? Like someone pointed out here, who was it they said about uh, – T? Uh, here we go. Ryan Jager in the chat says, uh, crazy, Watt has seven interceptions in his seven years, and Jair has ten in six years. That's pretty wild, isn't it? Mm-hmm. And, and I'll tell you right now, when they draw up the game plan, there is nothing involved in their game plan that says, hey, TJ might drop. They're going, we got to make sure we got two hats on that cat because number 90 is coming like a freight train every single play, right? And that's what makes it so effective. There's no one going into a game plan going, I think, I think Preston might drop here, right? And when it happens, you know, that's that's a beautiful thing. It's what Detroit did to Tampa the other day, and they did a good job breaking it down. I can't remember who was breaking it down. I was watching the tape earlier today, and uh, they were showing a lot of that mug look and then dropping back, and it was taking away that first read. That's the whole purpose of that. 
come to the line, you fire a blitz off this side, you drop back, the mic's already set, you look over, and you got a big six foot five edge standing right in your throwing lane back there, covering, you know, uh, covering that first hot, that first out, right? And you know, it's ball game typically. Now, the problem with that is you don't hit home with it when we when we did it this year. And I don't again, I don't think it was schemed up go game plan wise. Hey, let's put Preston Smith in the coverage. You just got caught in a bad look. That's where the real problem is, is that you didn't have a you didn't have an answer baked into that when it happened. You got that kind of straightened up toward the end of the year, but yeah, um, that's a wild stat though, Ryan. I didn't realize he has seven interceptions in seven years. That's pretty cool stuff, man. Um, all right, so now let's move on to we hit Pack Daddy's tweet, right? Talking about the potential DCs. Um, now let's do this. Let's talk about the top defenses in the league. All right, let's go. Let's start with points per play. Points per play. Your top defenses in the league. And we won't read off the numbers. We'll just tell you where they're ranked. Baltimore, Kansas City, San Francisco, Tampa Bay, Las Vegas, New Orleans, Pittsburgh, Buffalo, New York Jets, Houston, Minnesota, Green Bay, Tennessee, New England. Some of you guys are going, wait, they're they're talking about us potentially hiring people from Tennessee and we have better points per game. That is correct. That is correct. Or points per play. Points per game, the list is really similar. It shuffled a little bit like Tampa and New Orleans swap, but it's Baltimore, Kansas City, San Francisco, Buffalo, Tampa Bay, New Orleans, Las Vegas, Pittsburgh, Dallas, New York Jets, Houston, Minnesota, Green Bay, then New England. Passing defense. This is passing yards per attempt, okay? Opponent yards per passing attempt. Number one, Baltimore, Kansas City, New York Jets, Cleveland, San Francisco, Carolina, Buffalo, New England, Atlanta, New Orleans, Las Vegas, Dallas, Chicago, Minnesota. Rushing defense, opponent yards per rush attempt. New England, number one. Houston, Minnesota, Chicago, Detroit, Tennessee, Tampa Bay, Miami, Atlanta, Indianapolis, New York Jets, Carolina, L.A. Chargers, L.A. Rams. Um, So that's kind of how that falls into place. I listed those off. I charted it down here on my page just to kind of give you guys an idea. All right, so here's how it sits. When you look at their rankings, we'll go right down the list. Points per play, points per game, pass, uh, you know, passing yards per attempt, and rushing yards per attempt. Baltimore was first, 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 then 23rd. They were 23rd in yards per attempt against the run, and they got the best defense in the league, essentially. We talked about this all season long, that teams are building themselves, defenses are building themselves, to say, hey, look, we'll give you the run. Kansas City was notorious for it last year, right, when they won the Super Bowl. I remember Greg Cosell talking about it. These defenses are going, look, we'll give you the run. You're not patient enough to stick with it, right? The second one, Kansas City, in points per play, points per game, passing, and then rushing defense. Second, 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 and 25th, okay? San Francisco, third, third, fifth, 17th. Tampa Bay, 4th, 5th, 25th in passing defense, and then 7th in rushing defense. Las Vegas, 5th, 7th, 11th, and 18th. New Orleans, 6th, 6th, 10th, and 22nd. So to me, if you were to go, Clayton, you could pick one organization, or let's say three organizations that you could pull your next D.C. out of. For me, it would be Baltimore, Kansas City, and San Francisco. You know, Notice we didn't talk about Tennessee. Right. And people say, well, Vrabel's the answer. We should get Vrabel in. Let me give you two things here and why I disagree with it. A lot of people don't talk about this, but before LaFleur took the job in Green Bay, there were rumors everywhere that Matt LaFleur and Mike Vrabel were kind of at odds and Mike Vrabel was going to fire him that offseason. A lot of people don't know that. So you're saying they left on bad terms and Matt LaFleur is going to hire Mike Vrabel as the D.C. That's a big kind of flag for me. But on top of that, look at how bad their defense played. Like there, there was nothing special about Tennessee's defense this year, right? Mm-hmm. And immediately people go, well, it'd be different because he's the defensive coordinator. Well, we say, okay, when was I was like, when was the last time he was defensive coordinator? It was when he was in Houston. They were dead last in the league in defense. What is it about Vrabel other than he's a big imposing figure that you think that's the guy I want for DC? I just don't get it. I don't. So I would like to see them pluck them from one of those three. Now, what was our weakness we talked about all year? We talked about passing defense, right? That's the thing that really dipped on us hard this year. Like, I think we our total points per uh, total points per game, according to the 33rd team, which is essentially grading out how the players play, 
in those specific situations went from 7.6 points per or 7.6 total points for the year all the way down to 5.7. So we kind of identified, look, on defense, got to do something to bolster this pass defense. Again, why am I mentioning that? Look at this pass defense ranking here. Is Baltimore good this year? All right. Is Kansas City good this year? Everybody was clamoring how great the Jets defense was all year, right? I kind of disagreed with it at times. Cleveland, great defensive performance this year. San Francisco, great pass defense. Carolina, people are talking about Evero. That's the other thing, too. Everyone made fun of the fact that we hired Joe Barry and he was on an 0-16 team as a defensive coordinator. Who in the hell thinks he could coach? Evero just won two, two games this year as a defensive coordinator. Yep. They forget about that. These are all the things you got to take into consideration when you're looking to hire someone. Why would why did Evero get let go in Denver? Because the staff got canned, right? If he was so great, why wasn't he the head coach before he left Denver? I think it was Denver he was at, if I remember correctly. So then he goes to Carolina and they only win two games. It's like, what are we what are we even talking about here? So Buffalo 6.1, New England 6.2. So you can kind of see those top five teams. Those are all, uh, with the exception of the Jets, are all playoff teams, right? So, for me, it's, it's it's really narrowed down to Baltimore and Kansas City, and that's why I settled on Chris Hewitt. But San Francisco, I'm sure there's some gems in there, too. I what mean, I do like about the Jets, Clayton, is that they're they're looking consistent, 5.5, 5.8. You know, that's where I'm kind of looking, you know, yeah. back and forth. Let's bounce it. Let's see if we can be consistent for a couple of years because if mm-hmm. we're going to pull the trigger on this, I mean, we got to be sure, you yeah. know. Now, rushing defense, we we all have PTSD from rushing defense, right? I think we would all agree the last few years. So when you look at the rush defense, look at New England, only 3.3 yards per carry. Right. Yards per rush attempt, essentially. Uh, Houston, 3.6. They had a pretty good year, right? Minnesota. Five one, but 5-1 last year. So that's where I'm like, you know, right. you, jumped a, you jumped a yard and a half. What happened? Right. Good point. Um, Chicago, obviously. Uh, Detroit played pretty good against the run this year. Tennessee, they were a good run defense. They were. Um, but, again, if we're going to follow the blueprint of those top, you know, especially those top two teams that everybody's chasing right now, you need one, You need a top five passing defense in the league. And that's going to kind of uh, filter down or, or give you a, a result of points per game, points per play, which you see where they were number one and number two. So my pick is Chris Hewitt. I'd be happy with any great young mind coming out of – Baltimore, Kansas City, or San Francisco. I would prefer it would be someone who uh, is really, really familiar with the passing game coordinating, right? That's the main thing for me. So uh, that's kind of how I see it. You guys have anything you want to add to that, and we'll get to some offensive line uh, free agents here. Any, anything else you want to talk about as far as potential DCs, anything like that? Um, I guess, I mean, first of all, I'm co-signing everything you say, so I'm taking the easy way out. Uh, I'm with you, Clayton, on this. Uh, especially since, um, you know, my pick for 2024 DC is, uh, not going to be returning as DC. Um, but, uh, what about inside the building? Have we, we haven't really discussed potential names that are, you know, I, I feel like people aren't preparing Tim, you're going to do it. You're going to do it, Tim. I feel like they're not preparing themselves. That could very <laughs> well be what happens. Explain you know, to looking, explain to them at a list of people that just lost their jobs elsewhere to replace Joe Barry. You know, are there is there are there names on this staff now that could get moved up? I'm just going to say it. I'm going to say out loud what Tim's trying to get across here. <laughs> Do not freak out if magically all of a sudden Joe Barry goes back to being linebacker coach or some kind of assistant, and all of a sudden Coach Montgomery steps up as the DC or someone from within. Could you imagine the out? Oh my God, people would lose <laughs> their minds over that. Now, another name that got through away was Jer- through around was Jerry Gray, right? What if Jerry Gray okay. returned? I kind of feel like he left on bad terms. I could be wrong. That's just kind of the vibe I got last year. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah. So Jake Shavink in the chat says Tampa Bay and Detroit are high on the run defense list, and they were shredded all year through the air. There's a bit of a trade off, definitely. Um, that's why you know you could you, you follow you follow the breadcrumbs, right? You go, okay, who's having success in the league? It's a copycat league. And the top two teams are Baltimore and Kansas City when it comes to defense. And San Francisco, what are they doing? What did we say San Francisco did when we – first of all, let's go back to the wild card round. We scouted the Cowboys, and what did we say? Boy, this sets up kind of nice. They play a lot of man coverage. There's going to be some explosive opportunities. We boat race them out of Jerry World, Jerry World, right? 
And then all of a sudden, we go down to play San Francisco, and what did we come up that week? We were going, hey, they play a lot of zone. They keep everything in front of them. They try to just kind of bend but don't break, and, and they're loaded with talent, right? Fred Warner in the middle, we talked about it. Bosa on the edge, um, you know, all that. So they, they're they playing the pass. They're stopping the pass and saying, we'll give you a little bit of the run. Think about that, too. If they finish twenty or 25th, San Francisco, I'm sorry, 17th against the run as far as yards per attempt, and then think about how easy Aaron Jones ran on them, right? But what happened in the end? We gashed them for the 52, 56 yard or whatever it was by Aaron Jones. We didn't even get in the end zone. Why? Bend but don't break. Keep everything in front of you. Play in the pass first. It's it's where the NFL is right now. Yeah. Um, so J- Jake with a great point there too. There's a bit of a trade off, and that's universally true across the board. Like 99 percent of the time. You know, if you're good against the pass, you're probably not as good against the run and vice versa. I mean, we've seen it. Yeah. Yep. Um, Reef in the chat says Hewitt is good. Why? His passing mind. Again, let's go to their passing defense. We just talked about their number one in the league in points per game allowed, points per play allowed, and passing yards, yards per passing attempt. Okay. So they're number one of those three categories, which I think are the most important, right? He's the passing game coordinator for them. What what does that mean? You got the DC, and then you got the passing game coordinator. Okay, now he's been the passing game coordinator, coordinator, right? For like I can't remember, I don't know how many years he's held that position, but he's been been with Baltimore several years. He's a former player, spent two years in the league, and he's orchestrating, helping orchestrate this passing game coordination, essentially, in Baltimore. So to me, when you look at their success, it could be McDonald. I think that's his name, McDonald. Their uh, uh, their DC. It could be him. He could be all the magic, and we'll find out. But if it isn't him, and again, you they can block that lateral move. We can't go hire him. He's got to either take a head coaching job, or we can't get him. The next best thing would be Chris Hewitt as the passing game coordinator, in my opinion. So yep. that's it, why well, I settle on yeah. So I, I don't know what what do you think, Emilio? I don't. I, I'll say this, not to disappoint everybody, but I highly doubt it's going to be Jim Leonard, and I highly doubt it's going to be uh, Mike Vrabel in the building. I see it. I, those are names I've seen thrown around a lot. All right. The, yeah. The the only thing, Emilio, I'll say this. I'm going to turn it over to you. The Jim Leonard thing. There was smoke there last year, right? Or the year before. Whenever. Well, I say last year. God, it goes by so quick. When they hired Barry, there was smoke there, right? So. It sounded like he turned the job down, I think, for a hip replacement. He had to have some kind of hip surgery or something was the reason he didn't take the job, stepped away or what have you. Um, So there was smoke there. Now, here's what's crazy. This is what's going to blow your mind. I I promise I'm going to turn it over to you. I love this stuff. I could talk about it all night. Um, Jim Leonard, what style of defense does he run? Somebody asked me that. Mike Pettin's defense. So when we came here, when when we when Lafleur came here, I'm not married to him. When he got here, okay, Lafleur got here, Mike Pettin was already in place. What 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 happened behind the scenes that Mike Pettin ends up stepping away after whatever the next very next year, right? The defense took a step back, but as he stepped away, he immediately tried to hire Jim Leonard. Jim Leonard turned it down, so he settled on Joe Barry. All right, so if you look at the defensive numbers, the defense has gotten better since the Pettin year you know the the last year Petten was here i should say now he's in minnesota right so that's the defense you're going to get back what was the big knock on that defense do you guys remember that year what was so bad do y'all remember the playoff game where we got burnt over the top because we were playing cover two zone right before halftime yep too aggressive you're too aggressive so you can't have it both ways you know what i mean yeah. That's what you're potentially getting with Jim Litter. Now, listen, people can evolve, people can change, but I say that because I think I think there's a legitimate shot they hire Jim Leonard. I don't like it, but I think there's a legitimate shot they do. Milio, go ahead. Sorry. No, hey, I appreciate you. You're, you're teaching me, so I'm learning here all the same. Um, honestly, I the problem is, is as a defensive coordinator, he is going to be planning the entire time. Like, we need this dude to be X's and O's, like chalkboard, you know, 
head head in a book sort of thing. Like, yes, we need him to be personable and everything. But if they're, you know, if you're looking for someone who's cutthroat, fine. But he's also got to be smart in the books. I mean, we're going to have to put something together to to stop this. And if we're getting torched, there's a reason why. Um, and and again, even if he even if he can scheme up the best play, you know, sends Vince. I, the problem is, is the players still got to perform out on the field. So if they're not, you know, if they're not putting out what he needs or, or the play that he draws up, we're, we're going to be right back into this, you know, bowl that we were at the past three years of everyone wanting Joe gone. So um, it's, uh, you know, they're going to have to show up, the, the players included, what Matt say, April 15th, they're back. So they got this, they got this three months, enjoy it. And it's game time. We're going to have a new coordinator and everyone's going to have to show up ready to learn, ready to play. But they're going to, if it's a new person, they're going to learn new terms, new all this. So um, it's uh, time to show up. It yeah. makes me think of Preston Smith's comments about having a championship off season as players. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I think that's more important now than ever, since there's some uncertainty now, we don't know. I'm, I'm assuming we'll get an announcement sooner than later. I think the sooner you put somebody into that position, the better the organization's going to be. But, yeah. you know, the players got to be thinking right now, okay, what can I do to get better? What can I right. do to be faster? What can I do to stay on the field more? Um, maybe it's time to just, you know, right now, you know, dive into your own tape, you know, look at yourself on the all 22 and, and see where you were, you know, coming up short or maybe some near misses, things like that work, you know, be a self scout for yourself and have a championship off season and come into the building, uh, you know, in the spring OTAs, that kind of thing with the, the right mindset, regardless of who the coordinator is. You know, mm -hmm. I think that's a lot of this is on the players too. We talked about yeah. it all year about executing. So coordinator aside, you know, let's hope all these guys have that same uh, steam and mentality rolling through the off season as we go into uh, 2024. Definitely. A fame in the chat said, how about we hire Jim Leonard to play safety? Hey, Probably give us a little bit better than we've had here lately, man. Probably yeah, call, Ma call Mark down from the box and say, hey, man, we need you to suit up a couple more times. <laughs> exactly. Oh, man. Let's see, Mike uh, Hebring. Uh, yeah, here we go. Mike Hebring <laughs> with the super chat. Thank you, buddy. He said, uh, bring in a young up and comer, no retreads. Gotcha. <laughs> you laughing about Emilio. You think Mike. I said something else? No, no. Mike's funny, man. No retreads. <laughs> I like it, man. That's what I said. I kind of, I kind of feel the same way. Like, I know Tim. You, I think we disagree here, and that's totally cool. I think you would rather see someone who was an established DC in the past, right, and bring them in. Am I understanding you correctly, I mean, Tim? Someone, someone with experience, yeah. yeah. Or, yeah. or like you know, kind of like you said, <clears throat> someone who's been uh, close. You know, senior senior level coaching, uh, maybe hasn't had a crack at coordinator, but has been in a defensive room for a number of years. I'm just not interested in, you know, NCAA coaches. I'm not interested in, you know, people that are so far removed from being a DC at the NFL level. That's really where I'm at. It doesn't have to be, yeah. you know, a bona fide I mean, veteran. I just, I'm not, I'm not for giving somebody, you know, a, a you know, taking a gamble on a, a total newbie, you know, at, yeah. in this, I mean, we can't afford to get this wrong. So I mean, you're, you're moving the hashes 15 yards closer to each other. I mean, yeah. it's, it's a different game. Yep. Yeah, you're Absolutely. taking you're taking that that boxing ring and you're you're cutting it in half essentially. You know, um, it's there's little things like that people don't really grasp about the difference between the National Football League and college football. And uh, yeah, it's it's just it's just totally different ball game mm -hmm. for sure. Um, AFAM says fair point, Tim. Um, Mike Hebring says bring in Matt Lafleur of DCs. Uh, that's go. that's kind <laughs> of the approach I'm looking at. Like like. Yeah. Someone young, but has been in the league. That's why I'm not a big Jim Leonard guy. And and I, I listen. I don't. I don't. I'm not trying to like knock people or shoot it down. And again, you heard me. I think there's a legitimate shot that happens because that's a guy they had a target on before. Yeah. But I like to ask people if he hadn't played for Wisconsin, would you still feel the same way? And if that's the answer, okay. Why? Why would you still want him? You know, it's like Al Harris. If Al Harris hadn't, can we be real for a minute, please? If Al Harris hadn't played for the Packers, would you even be remotely thinking about him being DC for the Packers? Right. No one would be talking about it. No one. So, Al Harris is not remotely thinking of being a DC. Yeah, that's he it. said that. He said it himself. I right. mean, what more do you like? Don't let the truth get in the way of your narrative. You know, it's like the guy was literally asked verbatim and said he's not. Not really a scheme guy. 
you know, he likes to work with the players, hands-on, developmental kind of yeah. dude. In in his room, in his DB room, let him teach him, you know, yeah. those things. Now, if you said bring Al Harrison here to co- coach our secondary, okay, Sign me now, up. now now we might be might be having a conversation I can get involved with. What's yeah. up, Link? Link joining the stream. Yeah. Link's in here. He said, "Hey, bro, I ain't eight in two hours. Can I get?" Yeah, some- <laughs> it's about that time, big boy. All right, so let's get ready to wrap this thing up. We were going to hit on some of the offensive linemen, but you know what? It's a good place to kind of knock it off, seeing that he's going to start chewing on my leg here. Yeah. I care. Yeah. Um, so, Just don't uh, feed him any chili, Clayton. I tried this one chili, and it set my mouth on fire, and I had to drink a two-liter of Mountain Dew. <laughs> if, if Lincoln could talk, oh, that man. would be his accent. I guess <laughs> I guarantee that's how you would talk. He talked that redneck. Quit now, dude. We're wrapping up. Get off my back, all right? Yeah. All right, let's go ahead and wrap it up there. We're going to talk offensive line in the morning, if that's cool with mm-hmm. you guys, for Good Morning Lambo. We'll break down some of the free agents. One that Drew mentioned earlier really got my attention, that Connor guy, uh, center. Let me see. I think mm-hmm. I actually got it pulled up. I won't share it with you guys. Connor Williams from Miami. He's projected to only get a one-year, $6 million contract, and that, that dude – has gotten better every year. 2021, 75.2, 78.4, then 86.5. He's 26 years old. You plug him in at center, that changes everything about that offensive line. Imagine you plug him in at center, you take a couple swings in the draft, right? Mm-hmm. That could really fix your offensive line from a run-blocking standpoint, at least you know, right. get you on the right track. Because, again, what we came away with this year, guys, the big holes are on defense, right? you got to bolster that defense up. There's multiple positions across the board. It really, really, really starts with safety position. But defensive line, too, in my opinion, linebacker, all that. Uh, we broke some of those guys down. We'll hit on them again today because what I did was went and cross-checked them. We just strictly looked at PFF grade. Matter of fact, I'll just hit it right now. You guys know this morning we talked about Bobby Wagner, right? Yep. Bobby Wagner is projected to get a $4 million contract. People are going, Clayton, he's 170. I understand. I understand he's old. I got you. But still playing really good ball. You bring him in for one year, a one-year $4 million deal, if you can land that. I mean, high PFF grade, I went back and said, okay, what's his passer rating when targeted? Because, again, we're talking about bolstering this pass defense. That's the blueprint for winning in the league right now. We've got the pass rush, guys. We We just got a secondary and a linebacking core that, I mean, they they refuse to play schematically sound. I don't care what the play was called, if it was man coverage – if it was spot drop, if it was zone match, it didn't matter. They At times they would show it, but they were so inconsistent. Bobby Wagner, high PFF grade like we talked about, passer rating when targeted, 81.0. He was the 21st highest linebacker in passer rating when targeted. Some people are going, well, can't you get any better than that? When you're talking about $4 million per for one year, for a guy who's been there, won a Super Bowl, been years ago, I got you, played Future really good, mm-hmm. played, yeah, played elite level last year. You put him next to Quay, and you got Devondre competing for a spot too, and Devondre coming off the bench potentially if you don't get rid of him, Isaiah McDuffie behind them. You can take that linebacker room and turn it from a liability into a borderline strength now with one move right there for $4 million. Mm-hmm. Um, So, again, I wanted to cross-check it with the passer rating when targeted. Remember we talked about safety Geno Stone. Geno Stone, $6.5 million was his projected contract, right? He was, he was fairly young too. Guess what his passer rating when targeted was in Baltimore this year? 37.9. Fourth best amongst all safeties in the league. Wow. Projected at six and a half million. The other guy, the one I was most excited about, um, the Alohi Gilman from the Chargers, a lot younger. Listen, he really peaked last year. I mean, shot up in PFF grade. I went and checked his, right? He's a safety. Um, he's projected to only get 2.7 million. That's pennies on the freaking dollar. Okay. You understand that's like $5 million less per year than we gave Savage on that fifth year option to put that into perspective. 60.3 was his passer rating when targeted. So he had a high PFF grade. The passer rating when targeted checked out too on SIS. That's 14th best amongst safeties. If you didn't go get Bobby Wagner and you signed those two safeties somehow, some way, you're paying them just a little over a million more than you paid Savage last year. And you're going, you're going to have a safety tandem that had the fourth best and the 14th best passer rating when targeted and PFF grade to back it up. And they're both young, right? That could be a mm-hmm. good way to really raise, really raise the floor in the safety room. And then you still go out and get a Nubin in the draft, 
That's my guy, man. I'm just telling you. So if you were to do it, if you were to approach it that way, the uh, the alternate, the the other you know option is Darnell Savage at five million this year is what he's projected. Guess what his passer rate when targeted was? 109.4, 73rd in the league. You see the difference. You can completely revamp that defense for the new DC coming in. And Joe Barry's sitting in the back room going, These bastards could have done right. it for me. You know, you know what's nice about bargain chopping now is if you get it done and out of the way, you got your you know your pantry stocked. So we're we're good to go by the time he goes into the draft. He could start trading back into next year. I mean, if if he wanted another first round pick for you know when we're when we're in Green Bay, all right, cool. Let's trade back three of the picks we got this year. If you hammer out, you know, three or four of the players that we know are going to set up set a floor and, and you know be an anchor moving forward on the defense or offense. I don't care. Find yeah. this, you know, what let's you find a guy on the right deal. I love a screaming deal. Trust me, I'll I'll pull the trigger on just about anything if it's a good deal. So <laughs> Sign me up for three of them. We call that a family pack, and we're out of here. Let's go. <laughs> Bring it up. Bag it up. Yeah, bag, bag it, it up. up. We're going. We'll take them. And we'll, we'll take our draft picks, and we'll go sell them off for an, for a couple more next year. I'm down. <laughs> well, uh, Reef in the chat says, Walker and Wagner will be on the field. Dre comes in on the field on goal line. Come mm-hmm. on. Man. Come on. Sign me up. And, again, that's a tier two position, in my opinion, right, is you got linebacker and that center field. Free safety, right? The guy mm-hmm. who's when you play cover one, when you play that single high middle field close, the guy patrolling deep center, right? And you could you could still bring in Jonathan Owens, which we say would probably be about a million and a half, and have him sliding down in the box. I'm cool with just landing one of those safeties, but if you could land on both and someone like Bobby Wagner for four million, mm-hmm. like and to that again, point, Bobby is going to lay the lumber, right? I mean, he right. was Legion of the Boom for a reason. I, bring that. Bring that contact. That's that's exactly what we need on this defense. Wrap up and hit, please. Yeah, absolutely. All right. That's what she said. <laughs> that was a good line, Tim. That I was. appreciate that. Tim, Tim, you're getting so good at this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, we're out of here. Appreciate y'all hanging out with us. Um, We'll be back in the morning to talk O-line, and we'll kind of dive into the potential free agents and O-line. Maybe a little bit of tight end. We're looking for that fourth tight end on the roster, although I think it would be better to try to get just just a freak late in the draft, someone who's got a really high athletic score, and say, okay, maybe he pans out like Ben Sims. It's also a chance Goody pulls another Ben Sims out of his hat. I thought Ben Sims played pretty good this year. I thought that when he stepped in in place of DeGuara at times – that uh, and when Musgrave got hurt, it like the the offense didn't sputter. If anything, they kind of picked up a little bit, right? So I think we might have something there. But uh, the, the last comment about the coaches, I will say this: Christian uh, Nussbaumer, a uh, Nussbaumer says uh, Steve Belichick or the Ravens DB coach. I'd be I'd be cool with either one of those. I love I love the Belichick family. You know how I am. If Stephen Belichick, if you bring in that dude, they they Tim immediately said, does he still look the same? He looks like he's got a body. Hidden under his under his house. There's no two. Of them. You call me anything you want, but don't call me that. But man, that dude, still got that Kentucky waterfall going, huh? Oh yeah, dude, that's more than a Kentucky waterfall, bro. It's a, I don't even know what you call that, and I'm from Kentucky. So, um, anyway, let's give a special shout out for uh, for for all the super chats. We got Jason Y, Josh Martin, Josh Martin again, Mike Hebring, Mike Hebring, Mike Hebring again. Appreciate you guys supporting the stream. You guys are absolutely awesome. Thank y'all so much. We'll be back in the morning. Like I said, for Good Morning Lambo, we'll break down some offensive line potential free agents, maybe a little bit of tight end, and I'm sure there'll be something else to talk about. Who knows? Maybe we'll wake up to a tweet from Ian Rappaport or Adam, Adam Scheffner saying, hey, interviews taking place in Green Bay with this guy. So uh, we'll see. Paul Robertson says, Steve Belichick's mullet is the eighth wonder of the world. I completely agree, man. I love it. It's just – when I see a mullet like that, it takes me back to my sixth, you know, uh, sixth birthday. Oh yeah, all those bikers in the biker, you know, the 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 sleeveless vest, the blue jean vest, and everything, hanging out with all dad's friends. I can just smell Seagram Seven in the air. You know what I mean? <laughs> Whiskey flowing. So. Got that gas smell. You know, a lot of that going on too. All right, we're out of here, guys. Thank you all so much. For those of you listening on the pod, thank you for making us a part of your day. As always, let's go out and be the change we want to see in the world. And go back up. The power sweep. Actually, it's the it's the lead play in our in our offense. Yes, a Y end or a tight end to open up somewhere between six feet and nine feet. Get an isolation with the with the linebacker. Tell the tackle, take the defensive end if he's over him. If he's not, 
to drive down on the first man who is inside. Why YN has the linebacker taken out, he cuts inside. The YN has the linebacker here, he comes all the way around. If you look at this play, what we're trying to get is a seal here, and a seal here, and try to run this play in the alley. 